Have you ever thought how wonderful would it be to work for myself and leave all this off, all these office politics and all this other baloney behind me? Have you ever thought I like dogs way more than I like people? What if I told you you could make two to four thousand dollars a month part time, or five to six thousand dollars a month full time or more walking dogs? for yourself being your own boss. I'm going to share some of my best tips on what you need to get started, how you need to get started, and all the other details. And just in case you're wondering, I am a full-time dog walker and pet sitter. I've been full-time since 2017. I love it. I'm happy. I'm making the money that I'm talking about. I am kind of between part-time and full-time right now. I'm recovering from a surgery. I love it. It's the best decision that I ever made. I, I make the money, I do the job. I've been doing it for a long time in a big city. I live in Los Angeles and I am able to cover all my bills. I'm single, I, have, I own my own, my own condo. It's almost paid off. This lifestyle is doable. I want to encourage you to find something that you love to do. I know we all have bills, we all have to pay our bills, we have to be realistic. And I was a finance manager for 20 years in a car dealership and hated it but I did it because I had, it's what I had to do to cover my expenses. Nowadays, there are so many other ways to make money that there's really no reason to stay in a dead end job that you hate. So this video is made for everybody who wants more out of life and doesn't really know where to start. You might be overwhelmed by starting a business of your own, but I'm here to tell you that if I can do it, you can do it. And it's a lot easier than you think it is. It's, there's a list of things to do. There's a lot of legal stuff, but you can do it. Starting a dog walking business is one of the least expensive businesses that you can start. There are some apps and some documents and some gear that you will need, um, that you will need to spend a small amount of money. And I'm gonna share those in this video. First, I'm gonna go over the documents, licenses, and legal stuff, and insurance that you need. The documents and legal necessities of starting a business are often overwhelming and as a result, overlooked or delayed. Don't be afraid of setting up your business or side hustle correctly from the start. Here's a list of the minimum that you will need to keep your business legal and safe. Now you can start the business in your name. There's a lot of reasons to not do that. Most people start it as a sole proprietorship with a fictitious business name, which most people commonly refer to as a DBA. So that would be the minimum that you would need to do. You can also start from as an LLC from the start. There's a lot more cost and there's a lot more paperwork for an LLC. It's not unmanageable by, by any means. But if you want to go the low cost route and still be legal, you want to at least register a fictitious name with your county and state. Google your county and state because it's going to vary by location what the documentation is required but it's very easy. You don't need a third party site to, to register the paperwork. You don't need to go to LegalZoom legal or Rocket Law or anything like that. You just go to your city and county and go to their website and they will have forms that you can print online. You can either take them into the office and you don't need a notary in most cases, or you can notarize them and mail them in. The next thing that you're gonna need as a minimum is you're gonna need a business license. And this applies even if you're on a, a site like WAG or Rover, because you're still an independent contractor. The state and the county still consider you a small business. Even though you're using the apps to get the majority of your clients, you still have to have a business license. You can do this in your own name if you want, but again, anything, any licenses that you, that you file for are gonna become public record, along with the address that's posted, so I would warn against using your actual name and your physical and your home address on a document that's gonna go public just for privacy and security reasons. So what I would recommend doing is pick a name for your business that isn't your own and get, I have another video that I did about getting mailboxes and, and mailing addresses. And I would get one of those from the start because what, however you set up your business, the address that you use is going to be on public record. And when Google does a listing on your business, which they will automatically, even if you don't apply for it, they're gonna have your home address listed. And along with that, they're gonna have Google Maps 
that'll go with your home address showing your business. You don't want your business with a big arrow pointing to your home just for security reasons. So go ahead and go to some place like mailboxes, etc., or a UPS store and get one of those postal mailboxes that has a physical address. I'll link in the description the other video that goes over about the addresses and that I went with. If you set up your business from the beginning as an LLC, you'll also need to get an um, employer identification number, also known as an EIN number. If you're setting it up as a sole proprietorship, you can optionally get the EIN number, but you don't have to. You can use your personal social security when you file your taxes. Another thing that you'll want to get from the get-go is you'll need to have a separate checking account for the business, income and expenses. You don't want to mix your, you don't want to pay for these items out of your personal account. Don't commingle personal expenses with business expenses. It will become a nightmare at tax time. If you set up a business checking, a devoted business checking account from the start, then at tax time, everything that shows up in that business account is a business expense. All the income should be flowing into that account. All your expenses should be flowing out. You have everything that you need to get all the deductions at tax time. Now, there are several apps that I would recommend. Do you travel for work? Do you need to track your mileage at tax time so that you have a record of all the trips that you've taken that were business related? There's lots of good apps that will track them for you. The one that I use that I like the best is QuickBooks Self-Employed. The reason that I prefer the self-employed version over the other versions is because the self-employed version does track mileage. It tracks them automatically. It syncs with your phone. So whenever you make a trip, it's going to automatically track those miles. And then at the end of the day, when you come home, you can open up the app and look at it and you can just designate which were personal trips and which were business trips. And then at the end of the year, when it's time to do your taxes, you have a complete record of every trip that you've taken. It also tracks all of your expenses from the bank accounts that you sync to it. So if, if you're keeping a separate bank account for your business, it's going to sync every expense that you have. So at tax time, if you do your own taxes, it'll sync with TurboTax. If you don't do your own taxes and you use an accountant, you can export all of these files to your accountant and it makes it much more easy for them to finish up your taxes. And that way you don't miss out on any deductions. The other thing that I like about it is it also has reports. It'll generate a profit and loss statement. It'll tell you what your quarterly taxes are due. There's a, a, there's a few other features. The main one that I use it for is tracking my, my business expenses and tracking my mileage. Time to Pet is an app that I use specifically for my dog walking business. And what it does is it allows me to be competitive with apps like Rover and Wag where they're using tracking software and they're sending their customers a report card every time they have a walk. Time to Pet allows me to do that too. It allows me to schedule services, book the services, collect payments, send invoices. It allows me to sign electronic contracts with the customers and you know things like photo releases and releases of liability, permission to get the dog's veterinarian care if I'm doing pet sitting things like that. And then it also allows me to track reports so that I can see what my income is by customer year over year. And it also allows me to send report cards to the customers every time I have a service. So just like on Rover or WAG where you tell the customers how many times their pet pottied or how many times it had water or food, it also it does all of that. It also has room for you to take photos and send those to the customers within that report card. It allows you to, to, to send notes and it also has a GPS tracking um, on the app so that when you do take a walk, the customer can see where you went in the neighborhood and how far you went. It tracks the, the mileage. Most customers really enjoy that. They like the accountability. They like to be able to, to see what you've done, have some proof. The next app that I use on a regular basis is Canva. And most of you have probably already heard about Canva. Canva is a really nice, kind of like a photo shopping app it allows you to make marketing materials. I've used it for email marketing, thumbnails, banners. You'll also want liability insurance. As a dog walker or pet sitter, there are risks that you take when, whenever you go to work. A dog that you're walking could could bite somebody else. It could Somebody could get too close to you. You could not be paying attention. It would be negligent on your part 
because you're responsible for keeping the dog under your control at all times. The leash could break, the collar could snap, the dog could run into the street and be injured. All of those risks come on you if something happens to the dog that you're walking or to somebody else or some other dog that is walking near you that your dog injures or the dog that you're walking anyway. You could knock over a vase, you could lock yourself out and need to have the house rekeyed or have a locksmith come out. Liability insurance that's designed for pet sitters and dog walkers is available and it covers all of those things. I've had it every year that I've been in business. It's something that customers look for and it gives them extra peace of mind when you have it. So it's something that you don't wanna skip. You don't wanna take your chances and get it later. Now, if you're walking and doing your services on WAG or Rover, they do have liability insurance. It's not going to cover you. It's going to protect the clients and it's gonna protect the platform. So I would still recommend getting additional liability insurance, but it's not as critical because they do have some coverage. But if you're doing the dog walking or the pet sitting completely on your own, you absolutely need it. Don't take that chance and and work without liability insurance. It's a couple hundred dollars a, for the whole year and it renews once a year and it's well worth it. Now, if you're doing the work on your own and you're not primarily on a, an app like Wag or Rover, you're gonna wanna have something that offers your customers booking software, scheduling software, payment software, and report cards, because that's what they're used to when they go to Wag or Rover. They're used to having all of that stuff in one place. And there are a couple companies that offer that for pet sitters and dog walkers. The one that I personally use is Time to Pet. I've used them now for four or five years. They do everything that Wag or Rover does on their app. It has a calendar where you can see all of your customers in one spot. It will accept payments safely and securely. You never see the credit card information. You can um, bill your customers, you can send invoices, it has reports, it'll send a report card to the customer that has photos in it, just like Wag or Rover. And so it makes you look very professional. It also has a little GPS map, so it'll track where you've walked with the dog. And all of these things combined just give the customer much more peace of mind. And I've had a lot of compliments on it, so I would recommend Time to Pet. I'll put links to everything that I've mentioned in the description so you can find these things for your dog walking business. The next thing that I use every day that I would recommend you doing is setting up a budget for your business, as well as your personal, of course, but definitely for the business. You wanna see the money coming in and the money going out. It's it's not a business that has zero expenses. You have dog walking apps, you can write off your gas, you can write off leashes and other things that I'm gonna mention later, but anything that could be technically listed as a business expense, you should put in your budget so that you can see how much you're going to distribute to yourself as an owner distribution, basically your paycheck. The last app that I use is QuickBooks Online. I use this because I do my own taxes at the end of the year and I like to run my own profit and loss statements and see. I'm. I'm a little bit of a techie. I like to see all the numbers and I like to run reports. It also syncs with TurboTax. So at the end of the year, I can maximize my tax deductions and I don't miss any, which I really like. But QuickBooks Online is the one that I use. Now I'm gonna share the gear that I use. I use my own poo bags. Most customers are going to have poo bags available, but some don't. I also bring, I keep hand sanitizer in my car because you never know when your hand's gonna get on something yucky when you're scooping poo and if you're someplace that doesn't have water right away, it's nice to be able to get in there and sanitize your hands. Um, sometimes bags break. Sometimes a dog will slobber all over you. You don't know what you're touching. It's just nice to have some sanitizer. I keep a little bottle in my car and then I refill it as it gets empty. So I don't have a great big pump in there that's going to explode in the summertime, but I'll leave a small bottle in the car and even when it gets hot, I'll just pop the lid so it's open a little bit so that it doesn't explode. It's just a small amount so it doesn't make a big mess. The next thing that is an absolute must as far as gear is good, comfortable shoes. If you're a pet sitter, this isn't as critical, but if you're a dog walker, oh my goodness, you're gonna need good shoes. If you're walking 20,000 steps a day or 10 miles, you know, you figure the average dog walker can do 15 walks a day. That's seven and a half hours of walking if those are half hour walks. If your feet aren't used to that, your feet are gonna hurt. Uh, plantar fasciitis is very common. Problems with your knees, problems with your hips. A good pair of walking shoes or running shoes is what I would recommend. Something with good arch support if you need it. You'll know right away if your feet are gonna give you trouble and they probably will. You can't just walk in you know, shoes that have no support unless you're very young and your feet are perfect, but 
good shoes will definitely cause you a lot less pain and they'll cause you less back pain too. Now, as, as for bags, the, I started out with carrying nothing, but then there were things that I always wanted that I'd left in the car. So then I started carrying, wearing a fanny pack. And I noticed in the summertime, especially when it was hot, if I was wearing a fanny pack, the weight of it and the heat of it would make my back hurt by the end of the day, just having something around my waist all day. And so what I landed on was either a crossbody bag, which is what I like because it goes across your body diagonally. And the one, the favorite one that I had, I tried a couple different versions, but I like the tactical bags. And the reason that I like the tactical bags is because they have a lot of pockets and they have a lot of little rings. The little O-rings on the outside are perfect to clip key rings to. And so you have like maybe, I keep two sets of keys with me. I have one ring that has all my client keys on it that I leave at home when I'm not dog walking. And then I have another set that has my car keys and my home keys only. So on the weekends when I'm not walking dogs, I have this ring and during the week I have both, but I'll clip them to the sides of my bag so that I can quickly get in and out of houses, in and out of gates and things like that. And then the other thing that I always carry with me in my bag is pepper spray. You never know when, if you're walking in the hills, a coyote's gonna run up to you and the dogs that you're with, or if there's an off-leash dog that's aggressive, that wants to attack a little Pomeranian that you're walking or any size dog, really. I always carry pepper spray as a backup for self-defense. Luckily, I've never had to use it. I hope that I continue to not have to use it and every few years I buy a new one because they do expire, but I would rather do that than walk around without any protection at all. So I do carry pepper spray on me. And then also when I do evening, the I don't do very many evening walks anymore, but when I first started and I was trying to ramp up the business, I, I took walks all day and all night. But if I'm doing a nighttime walk and in the winter when nighttime comes earlier, my last walk of the day, can often be in the dark, be, you know, because it goes, it gets dark so early. And so I like to keep a headlamp in that bag as well. And I, I bought a rechargeable one so that if I don't have to fool with batteries, I can just charge it in the car. That way at night, I can wear it on my head. My hands are still free, but I can see people a block away with the headlamp. Whereas when I'm not wearing a headlamp, I can't tell who's coming up on us. For safety, that's, it's one, that's one factor, but also the dogs that I walk are often reactive and I need to know if people are coming at us because I'll usually cross the street or go around them or turn around to avoid them just to keep the dogs calmer. It's just easier to manage them if I avoid them going berserk. So a headlamp helps with that. Also, it helps you see if there's something in your way. You know, it, it keeps you a little safer on with your footing. If you can see what's on the sidewalk, the headlamp helps you find the poo in the dark too. Because if the dog is taking a poo and you can't see it, it's hard to find it. And you do need to, to clean that up. So a headlamp is a must at night. Another thing that I have over time learned to keep in the bag is a spare slip lead. The reason I keep a slip lead rather than just a regular leash is because I have had customers that have had collars that were ill-fitted for puppies or a harness that the puppy slips out of. And you wanna use the customer's equipment whenever possible, but sometimes their equipment is unsafe. So I had a puppy that was in a harness that was too big for it. And this puppy was an escape artist. We would walk out the door, the puppy would slip out of the harness, and then I would spend the next 10 minutes trying to, not chasing the puppy, cause that'll make it run but I would try and, you know, luring the puppy back and trying to lasso it with, you know, and try and get it back in its thing. I learned with the puppy to have a slip lead. So what I would do is I would put the slip lead on him, keep his harness on, leash him up with both, but I'd have two leashes so that when he slipped out of the, the harness, I still had him because they can't slip out of a slip lead. That's why they use them at groomers and vets is because a dog, if they pull, it just makes it tighter. A slip lead comes in handy. Plus, if you have a dog that has a collar that snaps open, if you have a slip lead in your bag, you have a way to capture that dog. If they get out of the harness, same thing. If the leash snaps. Now you should be checking the equipment before you go out. Make sure that the collars are secure. Make sure that the leashes aren't torn because if you have a big dog and the leash is starting to fray, if they jerk on it hard enough at a squirrel or a bunny or another dog, that's not a time that you want the leash to break. But I keep slip leads in my bag and I also have a couple in my, my car because I've ended up using them. And they also come in really handy when you see us, when you don't have dogs with you, maybe you're driving home from a walk and you see a stray dog in the neighborhood. I've used the slip leads on three different stray dogs that I have found and captured that were friendly and I was able to get them back to their owner because I because I had a slip lead. Another thing that comes in really handy, just as a side note with stray dogs, is if you pull up in a car and you open the door and you say, come on, get in. 
A lot of them like to go for rides because they're from homes in the neighbor and they'll hop right in your car so you don't even need a leash for half of them. But that's just my little tip on stray dogs. You can get them pretty easily, but unless you're chasing them. If you're chasing a dog, it just makes it run. Don't ever chase them. The next thing that I've learned the hard way to keep is a really good locking carabiner key ring. If you have a regular keychain and you have a pile of keys, it just gets awkward, it's bulky. This is the bag that I use. It's a tactical sling bag, and it's got a lot of places for hooks. Like right here, this is my main customer key ring, and this is the carabiner that I was talking about. It's It locks, it clips really easily onto things, but then if you roll this up, it locks. And then the one that I bought comes with these heavy-duty rings and then I've got all the customers on those key rings because they don't come off. I've tried others that were quick release before and they would break uh, the little teeny carabiners and they would break and I'd lose keys and I, I was lucky because I would see them come off the key ring or I would find that I would notice it right away and I would find them but I spent a lot of time looking in the grass for keys and so I like these I like I like this the, this design and this setup, I can hook it to a belt loop if I don't feel like carrying my bag that day. And I just snap them onto these rings, lock it, and it's not going anywhere. And then I've even got, I don't have them on here right now, but my personal key ring has got the same setup. It's a smaller carabiner, but I like those because I can hook them to things and lock them and they're not going anywhere. Let's talk about clothes for a minute. You can wear whatever you want but you're gonna want something that's comfortable, that looks appropriate, things like that. Athletic tops with cargo, um, cargo shorts or a skirt, something that's, that dries quickly. Basically, my preference for clothing is comfortable, appropriate, and professional looking. A lot of a lot of my friends that do this type of work wear uniforms. I'm not really a uniform type of person. I get bored. And the beauty of working for yourself is you don't have to be. But if you do wear the same thing every day, it makes it takes one less it takes one decision away in the morning that you have to make. And you can also write off uniforms. So as a business owner, the uniform idea is not a bad one. It kind of gives your brand a look and the neighbors will, can spot you right away because you look the same as you do all the time. So they always know it's you. Do you live or work somewhere where it gets consistently in the 100 degree plus temperatures during the summertime? Here in Los Angeles, we are approaching that time of year. Usually by July, any given day can be in the hundreds. So what I do is I send out an email to all of my customers and I tell them that we're gonna start the hot weather protocols, basically. And what that is, is any day that is over 90, 95 degrees, we're not gonna do one hour walks. We are not going to do extended walks. We're gonna play it by ear, see how the dog is doing. And if the dog seems like it's overheating, we're gonna end the walk. And all of my customers know this. They know that I do this because I'm protecting their paws. I'm protecting them from heat exhaustion and it's just better and healthier for the dogs. You might be wondering, well, do they want their, their money back because they're not getting a full 30 minute walk? And what I do that my customers receive very well is I still spend 30 minutes with the dog. I make sure that the dog gets out. It has a, an opportunity to, to pee and poo and do whatever it needs to do given the situation of the animal. And if they have a yard, we'll play in the yard on the grass. We will we still spend the time together so it doesn't impact the amount that I charge. Also, when I do walk them, I tell the customers that we are going to be walking on the shady side of the street. We're going to be taking the streets that have more trees and more grass, and I'm gonna be very mindful of their paws. In that same email, I also share with the customers what I recommend them doing this time of year, which is you know, walking on the shady side of the street, taking earlier walks. I also recommend that to my customers as well. I have a nine o'clock customer that once the summer weather hits, we're gonna switch it to eight o'clock my 4.30 walk, that's the end of the day, we're gonna move it more to 5.30 or 6. And 
this is something that we do every year. It's a normal thing. None of my customers complain about it. They know that it's for the benefit of their animal and they don't want me passing out and fainting either. So if you're a dog walker, what can you do to keep yourself from overheating if you're outside all day? The things that I do is I carry water. Um, I don't always have it on me because my walks in the heat of summer are no more than a half an hour, but I have it in my car in an insulated mug and it usually has ice in it so it stays nice and cold. Right now I'm on a morning walk so I don't have a big hat, but in the afternoon I'll bring out my big floppy hat that shades me. I'll bring out my sunglasses. I wear clothing that is wicking so it dries quickly and it's comfortable. I carry as little as possible around my waist because it just, everything's heavier when it's 100 degrees. I'll wear good comfortable shoes that have padding on them to protect my feet from the heat. And I wear sunscreen every day. Every day that I go out, I'm gonna put some sunscreen on to protect myself because I can be out five or six hours in a day or more, depending on how busy I am. And I also carry a little uh, collapsible water bowl. I don't have it on me right now because we're close to home, but a little collapsible silicone water bowl for the dogs. And when I do that, I do carry water on me if it's really hot. I have found that shortening the walks, I don't need to do that as much, but if I'm out hiking, I'll definitely carry that for, for whatever dogs I'm walking. Now, this video is in response to a question that one of my viewers asked. They said, would I please make a video about handling big aggressive dogs like Dobermans, Pit Bulls, Rottweilers, and German Shepherds? And I'm happy to do that. I'd handle all breeds of dogs. I try not to handle a dog larger than what I can handle, so I don't normally do Great Danes just because they're too strong for me. But the first thing that I wanna say about handling big aggressive dogs is if you think the dog is aggressive or dangerous, don't handle it. The number one tip that I have in handling large dogs is you have to have a respect for them and you have to feel comfortable, truly comfortable, not fake it till you make it comfortable, but really comfortable. And that comes with experience. A lot of these dogs have a bad reputation and it's based on fear. Did you know that more people are bit by a Labrador Retriever than any other breed? It's not the big Dobermans and Rottweilers and German Shepherds and Pit Bulls that are causing the majority of the damage. It's the dogs that people have the most of. More people have Labradors than any other dog, so they're gonna have more bites. Any dog can bite. Any dog can be aggressive. Any breed can be sweet and loving. A lot of it just depends on how they're trained, how they're handled, how they're socialized, and their environment. So if you feel like all pit bulls are bad or all German Shepherds are bad or Dobermans are bad, those are not dogs that you should be handling. Leave that to people who are comfortable with these dogs, respect them, and are not afraid of them. The main thing is that if you're afraid of a dog, if, you, if you're fearful when you're around a dog, any dog, that dog is gonna pick up on your fear and they're gonna mirror it to you. I have a Border Collie. She's a very sweet dog. She's never bitten anybody. She's very friendly. And we lived in an apartment about six years ago now when I lived in Texas. And there was one lady who was terrified of dogs. And you could tell that she was terrified of dogs because when I would come around the corner with Betty, she would go <gasps> like this. And as soon as she had body language like that and, and did her gaspy thing, my dog would start barking at her. Now, Betty didn't want to hurt anybody, but Betty thought there was something wrong with that woman. And every time that woman had a fear response to Betty, Betty had an aggressive response to her. And that's not the first time that's happened. Every dog that I walk, if you go up to them and you go <gasps> like this, that dog, ma the majority of those dogs are gonna start barking at you. And they are responding to the fear. I don't, a lot of people say they can smell it, that our bodies put off pheromones and, and smells that dogs can smell. I don't know if that's true or not, but dogs are very good at reading body language and they're very good at getting a sense of people. And dogs don't trust people that don't trust them. So if you don't trust the dog or if you're afraid of the dog, you think the dog's gonna hurt you, 
that's not a dog you should be caring for in my opinion. That's number one, is a lot of it's in your head. And if you're comfortable around, now that's not, that's not to say that you, that you should trust all dogs. I approach every dog that I meet slowly and cautiously because any dog can bite. And I know this. I have been bitten one time and it was by a tiny little fluffy dog. This dog was known to be a biter and it had to be muzzled to be handled. The owner recommended this. We knew this and that's the only time I ever got bit was putting the muzzle on this little dog. And this dog didn't bite me every time, but this dog was known to be a biter and it was not any of the breeds that people normally are afraid of. I think it was um, like a Maltese maybe, I'm not sure. But that's the only dog that ever bit me. I've never been bitten by a Rottweiler they're, they're big, strong dogs. If you're not strong and you don't have good upper body strength, they may be too much for you to walk. Not everybody can walk every dog. Even my Border Collie Betty, when my mother was still alive, she couldn't walk Betty. Betty lunges and she jerks unexpectedly from time to time. I've tried to train her out of that for the last seven years and she can still be unexpected if she sees a bunny or a cat. And you have to have slightly bent arms and you have to be ready because at any moment she's stronger than the huskies and the wolf dogs that I walk. She, she is just really, really strong and she's, it happens so fast that you're not expecting it. So that's a dog that has not, that knocked my mother down. I mean, she took my mom down to the ground. She did the same thing with, with my neighbor who was probably 105 pounds, maybe 100, maybe not even 100 pounds. But this woman had very, she had very good experience with dogs. She was very comfortable around Betty, but she didn't have the strength for Betty when Betty did her jerky lungy thing. So you have to know your limitations. You have to know how, how physically strong you are. That's number two is, you know, know, know your limits. Number three is if the dog has a bite history. I have one dog that I walk that has bitten people. It had, it was abused. It's a rescue. We're working on rehabilitating it. And it has bitten other dogs and it has bitten other people. We, we muzzle this dog before we take her out in public. We cannot take the risk of her biting another person. If she bites one more person, she'll, she will be confiscated by the, the county and she'll be euthanized. We know this. So we take precautions that protect her and everybody around her from her biting them. You know, people look at her and they give us dirty looks. They make comments, but the dog's alive. And when she's in her own home environment around people she knows, she's very sweet. But she was abused, she was starved, she was beaten. And maybe, maybe there's some genetics at play too. It, her breed has nothing to do with it. It's, it's her, it's her, it's in her nature. We have taken her to a trainer. We've taken her to a behavioral modification specialist and they've all recommended putting a muzzle on her when we take her out in public. So that's what we do. So if you have a dog that has ever bitten another dog or another person, don't trust that you can keep that dog safe when you're out in public. Now, when I'm walking her and I see other people or dogs, we do cross the street, we'll turn around. We avoid contact with other people. However, you never know when you're gonna turn a corner and somebody's got a dog that, that's off leash. And when those dogs run up to you, which they have with her, you need to have a muzzle on the dog as a backup. Now, if that do off leash dog got bit, it would be the owner's fault. Not, it would not be the, the dog that bites fault. However, do you want the hassle? I mean, it's just not worth it. So we keep her muzzled. Now, if she bit another person that got too close, again, we just don't want the hassle. So we always keep her muzzled. But you know, we do logistically, we try to avoid people and dogs. You know, if I'm, if I'm not walking her, I try to walk her on streets that are not very busy. I try to avoid high, highly congested places and I will cross the street or turn around and avoid, I avoid con contact as much as possible. But because you can never guarantee it 100%, there's always that person with their dog that's 
friendly and and happy and that owner is just not worried about their dog at all, that's the dog that, that could get killed if you have an aggressive dog that's not muzzled. So just for the safety, the public safety, we, we keep a muzzle on her. As far as handling techniques, there are things there are things that I do with big strong dogs. I always hold the leash in my right hand. I, I loop it over my wrist and then I direct traffic with my left hand. So I basically am holding these dogs with two hands. And that gives me maximum control over the dog. I have my elbows slightly bent because that makes my arms stronger. And if the dog lunges or pulls suddenly, I've got room to go. If my arms are already straight, then the only place I have to go is to be pulled off my center of gravity and it could knock me down. So because I don't want to fall down or get dragged by dogs, which I've seen other dog walkers, I've seen other people get dragged by huskies and, and strong dogs that want to run. I keep my elbows a little bent and when they start to lunge or pull, I also bend my knees. You can also work with the dog and teach them to walk nicely. And of course, I do recommend that with everybody. Everybody should work on teaching their dog to heal. However, if you're a dog walker and you're getting these dogs later in life and maybe they're six or seven years old and haven't had a lot of walking experience, it can be hard to train an older dog to heal. Not impossible, but harder and longer and you may not be spending a whole lot of time with the dog. So, and if the owner's not reinforcing what you're teaching the dog, it's gonna make it that much harder. So that's when I use my defensive moves. The, the bent elbows, I bend my knees a little bit. I, I don't spend time on my phone. You know, I don't listen to podcasts or have earbuds in. My attention is on the dog and my surroundings. I'm watching for bunnies and cats, things that they might wanna chase. I'm also watching for coyotes, things that might wanna chase us. I do a lot of dog walks near the hills where there's a lot of coyotes. And this time of year, there's more than ever, this it seems. So I'm, I'm always very present on my dog walks. I'm watching for off-leash dogs. I'm watching for humans that wanna get too close. And you'd be surprised, people will even try and pet the dog that's muzzled. I'm just always watching for whatever's about to come at me. So those are my defensive moves. And that's, that's pretty much it. The, the, really the number one thing is though you have to be comfortable with the dog. If you're comfortable with the dog and the dog trusts and respects you, that's, that's the biggest hurdle. If you're afraid of the dog, leave it to somebody else to walk. Why did I quit pet sitting and dog walking on Rover and WAG after I was on the Rover app for five years and WAG for a year? Simple. My own pet care business was busy enough, it no longer made financial or strategic sense to take the extra business that I could get from having an active profile on Rover and WAG anymore. The high cost, lack of process control, and reputation were the main factors that I considered when making this decision. Rover and WAG both take a healthy chunk of the commission earned by the dog walkers and pet sitters on their apps. They do a great job of marketing and the apps are popular, so I understand that this is worth a lot, but WAG takes 40%. That is a lot. That is before you pay your income taxes on the money earned or fill your gas tank. Rover takes 25%. Those fees really add up. Fees, such high fees. I could justify paying those fees when I struggle to find customers at the beginning of my pet care business. Better to be busy and earning money than sitting at home wondering how I would pay my bills. Getting the word out for a new business takes time. By signing up for Rover and WAG in the beginning, it kept me busy. It got me in front of clients. By providing good service, customers told their friends. It didn't take long for that to snowball into a thriving business. Starting on WAG or Rover makes sense if you don't have your first client yet, or you're not sure how serious you are about a pet care business. If you need some extra cash on the side, these apps may be perfect for you. Keep in mind that you are not an employee with these apps. However small, you are still running a small business. Rover and WAG offer some insurance to the clients. They will also suspend your account if a pet is ever injured until they investigate the issue fully. If the dog runs out on your watch, you will be removed, and rightfully so. But you are still responsible if a pet or home gets damaged and the client wants to pursue legal action. The insurance that these apps offer does not provide any coverage if you get hurt while working, there is no workman's comp insurance provided. If you want that, it's costly to purchase for yourself in many areas. I researched it when I first started working in this field and the cost quoted was over $4,000 per year for workman's comp and excluded the owner of the business. 
which was me. Health insurance is also paid out of pocket. Your car expenses can add up too, and you do need a reliable car in most areas. I started on the apps with boarding and then later pet sitting and really found my groove when I switched to dog walking. With clients that wanted me to stay overnight and not leave 24 hour care, I charged $200 a day. With clients that didn't need me to stay at their home 24 seven, I charged per visit from 20 to $30, depending on what was needed and how many pets they had. When I signed up for WAG, I was shocked to see that they determined the pricing for walks and pet sitting. Dog walking charges were reasonable, but pet sitting was $30 per day. There were no clear rules for how long you stayed at the home. It was confusing for the clients, which made them angry. I called WAG to ask what, was, what the expectations were, and they said to let the dog out for potty breaks and make sure you feed them. And that was it, you didn't have to stay. The clients thought someone was staying at their home all day, walking their dogs multiple times during the day, picking up their mail, taking out the trash, and leaving their home spotless for $30. It seems like a fantastic deal if you're the client, but to work all day for $30 in the United States will leave you destitute and bitter very quickly. On the other hand, with Rover, you determine your prices. This made more sense and is why I lasted a lot longer on the Rover app. I barely made it a year on the WAG app. Both apps will hire anyone with a clean background check that can pass a simple common sense test. They have a few videos to watch and call that pet care training. Reputation. Many of the walkers on both of these apps are less experienced and very inexpensive. That's your competition. Because of this, they've earned both apps a horrible reputation. Both apps are now known for losing and harming dogs, resulting in the death of family pets. The video circulated on social media showing home fo camera footage of wild parties being thrown in customers' homes are usually Rover and Wag sitters. A few rotten sitters and walkers have made customers very wary of anyone that works on those apps. This is not to say that every person on the app is clueless because they're obviously not, but it doesn't take more than a handful of bad people to just ruin the reputation of a business. There are many good people on the app, but the reputation and the horror stories are something that you will need to overcome with new potential clients. This can be a problem with the industry in general. All it takes is for someone to have a bad experience with another walker or sitter, and then you're up against that, that chip on their shoulder when, when you meet them. But as a smart business owner, the reputation of my business is vital to my success. I didn't want to be associated with groups that were becoming known for carelessness. It was more important for me to protect the image of my own business than to continue picking up a few extra walks here and there with the Rover and the WAG app. And then policies. When you use the Rover and WAG app, you're subject to their policies. They can also change their policies at any time. And I wanted more control over how I ran my business. The biggest of those policies is related to customer contact information. When you acquire customers through Rover or WAG, they're not your customers. They belong to Rover or WAG. You do not have permission to contact them privately. They don't give you the customer's real phone numbers or email addresses. You only have access to their address when you have a request and then all the information disappears after the service is over. If you are suspected of communicating with the customer off the app, they can delete your account without notice. Email lists are valuable. Many business owners believe the email list to be the most valuable marketing asset you could have. And if you're on the Rover or WAG app, you don't have any of that information. I want to be able to communicate with my customers and to promote my business directly to them. And they want that too. I was constantly reminding my customers to not communicate with me off app. Of course, you have to be respectful of privacy and follow local email laws. It's not going to do you any good if you upset your customers by spamming them or sending them constant emails. They'll go elsewhere. So you have to be smart about it. But you also have to have that information. You have to have the list of how to contact your customers when you have something new that comes out or you have a, you want to run a sale. You want to be able to communicate that directly to your customers. And then there's the competition. On the dog walking apps, your competition is listed right above and below your profile. When I have customers referred to me personally, they may be considering other pet care providers and they probably are, but they won't be looking at us all on the same page and they won't have all of our prices lined right up next to each other. And then there's insurance. As a business owner, insurance is important. With Rover and WAG, the insurance they offer is designed to protect Rover and WAG, not the walker or the sitter or really even the customer. They don't provide any coverage to the sitter or walker. If you get hurt on a walk, you're on your own. When selecting insurance, I can select the policy that protects me, my business, and my customers. By ensuring coverage for accidents that can happen to the dog or the home, I can select the amount of coverage too. 
I have higher limits of coverage on my own policies than I did through the Rover and WAG apps. I never intended to be on these apps as long as I was. I would use them again if I was starting though. I tried to market my business when I first started. I printed business cards, flyers, door hangers, and I hit the pavement trying to get the word out about my new business. I walked all over town putting door hangers on doorknobs and flyers on cars. I posted on social media. I never got a single client that way though. I got my clients one at a time from friends of clients I found on Rover, Wet or in Wag, neighbors who saw that I was walking dogs. I had a, a magnetic sign that I put on my car and I posted a flyer in the laundry room where I live with my face on it and my dog. And so my neighbors knew what I did. Letting people know what you do is the best advertisement because people want to people want to buy from people they know first. They would rather not have a stranger come in their house and take care of their dog. They would rather have somebody that a friend had already used or a family member had already used or somebody that they've seen walking dogs and and the dogs are happy. People don't want to just have a stranger come in their home. They're very, it's it's unnatural to think that that is something that's great. It was a grind and it didn't happen overnight. There were other benefits to using the apps though. So I don't wanna say that everything about the app is bad. When I was caring for my mom, I was grateful that I could accept or decline service requests on the app because if I declined an, if I declined a service, the app would send the customer to the next available walker and the customers weren't impacted by my being busy. This was much less stressful than in my own business. I have to nurture those relationships more than I do on Wagner Rover because I'm solo and there isn't someone else to pick up the slack if I decline a request. By working with WAG and Rover, I could take time to get my website up and running too. But in five years of having my own website, it only attracted two customers total, only one of those scheduled services. I use the website more to direct referrals to sign up. It has not been the lead generator that I planned it to be. It has been more successful as a way to communicate with my clients through the blogs that I post on the site. My final takeaway on WAG and Rover is that I'm grateful that they exist. They got me started in this business. They helped me. They were kind of like a set of training wheels in the beginning. I'm ready to take the training wheels off and I'm ready to to ride solo. But I am grateful that I had them in the beginning beginning because they did make starting my business much easier. And I would I would use them again. One of the basics for having options and freedom is your money. I have been a lifelong budgeter. I'm a planner. I am definitely a work in progress. First off, do you use a an app or do you just use pen and paper? That's up to you. I used an app for years and years and years. I loved the Mint app, but they did away with it last year. That I thought about it and I thought, you know, I've been simplifying my budget over the last year as I've been paying down accounts. If you have way too many credit accounts, way too many payments, then a budgeting app Budgeting app software may still be of benefit to you, but I found that when I wrote everything down on paper and I was doing a weekly zero-based budget, it was easier. I was making it easier. I do believe that it's good to have a monthly idea of what everything everything that you're going to spend. And so I do still have a monthly budget. You can do this on a single sheet of paper. You can do this in a budgeting journal. This one is a Clever Fox budgeting journal, and I got this on Amazon. It was not expensive. This one is a 12 month journal and it's got spaces for you to set your goals. You can do uh, yearly goals in it. You know, it's got a spot for finance goals. It's got a spot for your monthly budget, your income and your outgoes. And then I also do a weekly budget because I pay myself weekly. I'm self-employed. All of my income is coming from me and my businesses. And so I pay myself on average $1,000 a week. I write it out on a sheet of paper. I created a weekly budgeting template on Canva, but you don't even need to do that. You can just do it on a single sheet of paper. I'm going to show you how I set that up. Now, first, I have a couple different categories. And because I have a cash budgeting system, I have envelopes. This binder, is the binder that I that I pay my bills in. What I've done is I've gotten two months ahead. I was doing one of those 100 envelope challenges and I was already one month ahead, which means the money that I'm putting in here was for not for the current month that we're in, but it was for the next month. In here, I've got things like an envelope for my mortgage, an envelope for HOA dues, an envelope for subscriptions and utilities, car insurance, home insurance, things like that. So. Everything, 
all the things that are fixed that are exactly the same month in and month out, I have categorized in envelopes in here. My envelopes look like this and it's really easy to see where I'm at. I can tell when this one is almost full. I think all I'm missing is the big ones. I've got more of the mortgage money I need to put in and my HOA money. But everything else for the month is already filled. And and one of the reasons that I was able to do that is I've reduced all of my, my bills quite a bit. So my monthly overhead on fixed expenses is relatively low for someone living in Los Angeles. Another binder that I fill each week is my debt binder. I do have credit card debt. This is kind of the same system. I've got the credit cards and I've got the minimum monthly payments in here as well as any extra that I can put towards a credit card. And then at the end of the month, I, I empty this and I put it in my, I put the cash from here in my checking account to cover the next month. The money that's gonna pay my minimum payments on my fixed expenses and my credit cards and my debts, I'm making this video in January. The, the money to cover my bills in January is already in my checking account. These binders are covering the next month. And then I've also got a different binder that I cover sinking funds. And if you don't know what a sinking fund is, a sinking fund is a savings account. And these are not, these are just envelopes. These are basically envelopes for different things that come up, not every month, but they come up on a regular basis and I know they're coming. This would be things like your car registration, your property taxes, your income taxes. If you're self-employed like I am, I have emergency money in here. I've got medical co-pays, things like birthdays, Christmas, vacations, car maintenance, vet bills, self-care. That one hasn't gotten anything in a long time. Home, home improvement projects, home repairs, renovations. Any of those things that you wanna do, but you don't necessarily pay for them every month, but you know they're coming and, and you want to get them done, that's a sinking fund. So you set aside money each each week or each month or however often you can, and you, you take care of those things so that when they come up, you don't have to figure out well, where am I, how am I gonna pay for this? And you don't have to go reach for a credit card and pay for these things that don't happen very often. You can do things like your insurance, you can have money set aside for insurance deductibles. Basically anything that could come at you, you, you put a sinking fund. You're probably thinking, well, how can I even think of all these things? Well, the first month you may not think of all these things. As they come up, you add them to your list. I have a running list in the front of each of these binders. I've got one for all the things that I want a sinking fund for. I've got one for all my current credit cards with their uh, minimum payments as well as the balance due. And then I've got one for all my fixed expenses. Now, this year, my HOA fees went up almost $100. So I changed what I was saving for the HOA. So this is not set in stone. So as things change, you adjust. It makes it easier to adjust when you have a little bit of a cushion. My checking account only pays my bills. I don't pay for anything else out of my checking account. If I wanna go buy clothes or if I wanna buy groceries or gas or any of those little runaround things, I pay for those out of the cash in my wallet. And I've made a different video on my variable expenses and cash stuffing my variable expenses. And I'm gonna link that at the end so you can see how I do that because I don't have my wallet handy right now. If I wanna do shopping or if I wanna buy something for my house, it doesn't come out of my checking account. My checking account only pays my bills, my debts, and the things that I'm saving for in my sinking funds. And the way that I pay for those things is I save for them, for them in these binders. And then at the end of the month, I empty the binders and I deposit that money into the account. Now, I got two months ahead. This is January right now when I'm filming this as an example. The money for all my January bills is already in my checking account. So I'm the money that's going in here would technically be for February. However, what I did was every time I got an extra dollar, I got a couple windfalls last, last month, I got some Christmas bonus money, I got a tax refund on my property taxes, all that extra money, I filled these binders up, these binders up as quickly as I could. And I filled them before the end of the month. So when I filled them, I emptied them. And then I also was doing a 100 envelope savings challenge. You're not gonna see me unstuffing the 100 envelope savings challenge because I got impatient, I've got a major surgery coming up and I wanted to get as far ahead on my months as possible. I wanted to get three months of expenses saved up and I was able to do it. 
So what I did was when I filled up my bills and my debt binders, I emptied those and I put them in this pouch. This is enough to cover one month of expenses. So I've got, and I need to deposit this and I need to take this and, and put it in the bank. But I've already got the money for this month in the bank. I've got the money set aside for another month. Could be next month. And then these binders are almost full for the next month. This month, next month, and the following month are just about covered. I've got, I still have to, to stuff the money for the mortgage and the HOA in the fixed bills, but I've got the money set aside. I think I've got everything set aside for credit cards. No, I still have a little bit left. I think I've got 75 I need, and I've got about $300 left that I need to, to make minimum payments on my credit cards for a month, HOA and mortgage. But everything else is covered. So I've got this month, next month, and almost a third month here. The way that I did that was I started just pouring everything that I could into these extra months. Now, the last couple of weeks have been really slow. And normally when I was living paycheck to paycheck, that would be a major problem because I've got bills that are coming due. But because I've already got the money in the account for this month, the slow months do still make me nervous because if I have too many of them, it's going to affect me at, you know, it'll catch up to me at some point, but it doesn't catch up to me as quickly now because I've got this month covered, next month covered, and the following month, almost covered. So I've got time. Before I didn't have time, I had to scramble. The peace that comes with knowing that I'm covered for almost three months is amazing, especially with uh, a brain surgery coming up. I will probably be out of, I will be out of work for at least one month. I could be out of work for long, who knows how much longer. It could be two months, it could be three months, it could be six months. There's just, there's no way of knowing until it happens. I am planning on recovering as quickly as possible. I'm healthy. There's no reason for me to have complications that I can see, so I'm not gonna worry about, I'm not gonna worry about things that are completely out of my control. But what I am gonna do is continue to save, continue to be mindful with my money. My house is, I've pretty much gotten done all of my little honeydews around the house and I'm just gonna keep going. The easiest way to do your budget is to get a sheet of paper, just a blank sheet of paper. You can use a blank journal that has lines in it, doesn't matter. Write out your income and your expenses. I would do it in these categories. The first, cat. once you figure out what your income is, and you can do this every time you get paid, you can do this once a week, once every two weeks, once a month, whatever works for you. But you need to know what your bills are. So the first category that you're gonna pay is going to be the things you have to, your home, your utilities, things like that. This is the must do's. The must do's that you know are coming for every month. Write those out next. So those are your fixed expenses. The next category that I'm gonna pay personally is I wanna keep my credit good, so I'm gonna pay my credit. Right now, we're just doing minimum payments. So you've got your fixed expenses in one column and you've got your credit card debts. The next thing is your variable expenses. These are things like the things that you're gonna go around town and take care of your errands, groceries. I'm stocked up on food. So I don't have three months of money set aside for food and gas because I probably got three months of food in already prepared in my freezer. I've been making meals ahead of time to get ready for my surgery. I've also been buying prepackaged meals when they went on sale. So I'm good on food. I'm also not setting aside money for gas because I'm not going anywhere. I fill my tank every Friday. When I'm not preparing for a surgery, then I would have food in my wallet each week. I would, I would put the amount that I have budgeted for food, the amount that I've budgeted for gas, and the thing with that is if you see that you're spending more than what your budget is and you're stealing it from other places, then the f you fine tune it. Every week you see what's left in your wallet and you're gonna know very quickly what you really need. If you're, if you're one of those people that says, I'm gonna spend $100 a month on groceries and then you see stuff on sale or you wanna do a drive-through, just be realistic with it. You know, if you can't do $25 a week, and you're consistently spending 50 or 100, then that's what you need to change your budget to. It needs to be realistic because if it's not realistic, you're gonna throw it out the window and just say, I can't do it. So be realistic with this, especially in the beginning. If you're spending 
if you look through your bank account and you see all your debit transactions and you see that you're spending three or four hundred dollars a month on groceries, then don't try to go to a hundred dollars a month on groceries on the first pass. You know, reduce it in stages. You know, maybe do 20% less or 30% less or cut out the drive throughs or cut out half the drive throughs instead of going every day for lunch, you know, pack your lunch three days a week and let yourself go out twice a, a week. The idea with a budget is not to, to restrict yourself and to torture yourself. It's not supposed to be torture. These are your resources to do with whatever you want. And if you want to eat out and that brings you joy, plan for it. You know, you can have an envelope for dining out, just plan for it. If you're going out to restaurants every night with your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, because you didn't go to the grocery store, you don't even like the food, then you're wasting your money. If you're going out for the experience and to give somebody a break and you really enjoy it, that's a completely different thing and you can plan for that. So whatever your variable expenses are, you can plan for them. And then the final category that you should have on your budget is your savings goals. This can be things like if you're saving for a down payment on a house, if you need an emergency fund, and before you, you pay extra, on your credit cards, you need to have three to six months of emergency money set aside. I made another video about how ludicrous being set with only a thousand dollars is. There's a there is a very famous budget guy online who says, you know, save a thousand dollars before you do anything, and th and that's not bad advice. A thousand dollars is something you should have in your in your account. It's just not enough. I'm facing a brain surgery. I'm going to be out of work for one to three months at least. A thousand dollars won't even, it'll get me through one week. If you're self-employed, especially, you've got to have reserves. If you have a job that's going to pay you short-term disability, that's different. You know, if you've got all the insurance and you've got a spouse and you've got a safety net other than cash, wonderful. I don't have that. I'm single. I am a divorced woman, self-employed, and $1,000 would not be nearly enough for me. So for me, three months is my bare minimum. I'm going to work towards six months. Six months to a year would make would give me much more peace of mind. You know, I, I'm not gonna park it in my checking account. I'm gonna put it in a high yield savings account where it's liquid and available for all the things that life throws at you. Life is gonna throw something at all of us. It's just a matter of what it's gonna be and when it's gonna be. That's basically what you need to do on a budget. So what I do each week is I transfer $1,000. That's what I'm paying myself. I transfer $1,000 from my business checking to my personal checking. Each week, I will, t I will withdraw that thousand dollars because I'm already ahead. I've already got this month's money set aside and I've got next month's money ready to ready to transfer into that account. So what I do each week is I will go to the bank once a week and I will withdraw the thousand dollars. I will take 500 of that and I will put it in the binder for my bills. So $500 a week will go in here. 250 a week will go into my credit and my loan account. $100 will go into my wallet and then another 150 minimum is gonna go into savings. The weeks that I can save more are weeks that I made more, but on average, I'm gonna make $1,000 a week. And so that's what I pay myself. If I have a week that is less, I have a week that's less. I am currently almost three months ahead. So if I do have a week that's less, I have time to make it up the next week or the, the following week. If I have too many weeks that are less in a row, I need to revisit my budget. I also need to revisit what I'm paying myself each week. If I don't have the clients to support the thousand dollars a week, then I just have to change my budget and I'm self-employed. So that can happen. I've had two weeks in a row that were less than a thousand but now I've just booked a big pet sitting job. And so next week is gonna be more than a thousand. So it does average out. And because I'm two, almost three months ahead, I have time to let it average out. Now, if I have a week where I can pay myself more, then it generally goes more towards savings or I might treat myself. I might give myself a little bit of self care money or shopping money, but it's planned. There's a plan for it. Before I spend anything, before I go to Amazon and buy anything online, before I go window shopping or to Home Goods or TJ Maxx, I know exactly how much I can spend. And I haven't gone to any of those stores in months and months and months because it hasn't been part of my plan. I shop once a week on Fridays on, on after I get paid and I've gone to the bank and gotten my cash. 
I fill up my tank once a week. I don't drive so much that I need to fill it up more than once a week. All of my customers, I, I keep close. I have a tight service area because I don't want to spend a lot on gas. It's it's not worth it. I use one tank of gas every, I don't even use a full tank of gas. I usually use a half a tank of gas, sometimes a quarter tank of gas because my customers are all very close to each other. But I fill up on Fridays. I wash my car on Fridays. I get my groceries on Fridays. If I have any other errands, I do that on Fridays. I do all of my errands together. That also saves on gas and driving. My car doesn't have a lot of miles on it. It's been paid off since 2017. Haven't had a car payment since 2017, don't need one. I've got a Toyota, it's a good car. I'll buy another Toyota when it's when it's time. I set aside money for maintenance. I have routines, but that's what I do with my budget. I'm feeling so much more peaceful about it as I've gotten farther ahead. When I first got diagnosed with this brain tumor, I was one month ahead. I was in a panic because I thought, well, what am I gonna do if I can't work for two? You know, one month ahead wasn't enough. So I worked really hard. I took every job that came my way. I was grateful for every job that came my way. I was happy to do it. I love what I do. So working extra was not a hardship for me at all. I really truly love what I do. So I just leaned in. I leaned in, I tightened the belt, I I didn't go crazy at the grocery store, I didn't go crazy for Christmas. I had a very simple Christmas. I haven't been buying home things. I haven't been starting any new major home improvements, which I would normally love to do, but I'm just, you know, just kind of coasting and saving. I'm in saving mode. It's funny, I saw all these videos come up about no spend Januaries, and I've had a no spend October, November, December already. And a January is a piece of cake for me. You can do a, a, an entire budget on a single sheet of paper. You can use Google Docs. You can use an app. It doesn't really matter how you do it. Just you've got to know what your what your money is, where your money is coming from and where it's going out. I know when I don't track a budget and I don't keep track, I just, you know, you can fritter it away on, on things that, that you're going to end up decluttering and taking to a thrift store or giving away. Just hold off on stuff like that and get your money right because there's so much peace that comes with money in the bank. It's just, it's a game changer. I hope this helps somebody. That's, that's why I make these videos and I hope you have a great day. I'll see you next time.